In this video, I'll briefly talk about IV fluids. As an overview, when it comes to IV fluids for the purposes of your exam, and even when you're on rotations, you really want to separate IV fluids into two broad categories. One category is crystalloids, the other category is colloids. Crystalloids are solutions that contain small molecular weight molecules, whereas colloids contain high molecular weight molecules. The crystalloids are generally used for maintenance and fluid resuscitation. Some examples of crystalloids include normal saline, half normal saline, and lactated ringers. Colloids, on the other hand, generate pretty significant intravascular oncotic pressure and tend to be less utilized because they come with more side effects and they're more costly. Some examples of colloids include albumin or fresh frozen plasma. So for the purposes of exams and with the goal of clearing up confusion that you may have regarding IV fluids, this video I will just be focusing on crystalloids because that tends to make up the bulk of any questions that could show up on exams and it also tends to create the most confusion for medical students. So let's go through a few categories of crystalloids. This video shouldn't take very long because there's just three broad categories we should talk about. The first category are isotonic crystalloids. And the two big examples here are normal saline, which is 0.9% sodium chloride, and lactated ringer solution. Now I've put in the table the composition of each and main adverse effects to keep in mind. For normal saline, the composition is going to have sodium and chloride. Sodium is 154 milli equivalents per liter, and chloride is the same. Main adverse effect for normal saline is increased risk of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Lactated ringer solution has 130 milli equivalents per liter of sodium, 109 milli equivalents per liter of chloride, 4 milli equivalents per liter of potassium, 2.7 milliequivalents per liter of calcium, and 28 milliequivalents per liter of lactate. The adverse effects in lactated ringer solution, there's two that you should know about. One is technically you could cause hyperkalemia, although that risk is probably overstated. And two, there's a risk of red blood cell aggregation and clotting the line, and I'll touch on this in just, in just one moment. So for normal saline, big adverse effect is that it can cause technically hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. In short, all you need to know is that because normal saline is slightly more acidic than the normal body pH, when you're giving somebody normal saline, you run the risk of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And so for this reason, when aggressive fluid resuscitation is needed, lactated ringers is actually a pretty good solution. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. One, in lactated ringers, and hence the name, there's lactate. So that lactate actually gets converted to bicarbonate by the liver. And so it's nice because it doesn't have as large a risk of causing metabolic acidosis because the bicarbonate essentially acts as a buffer. However, something to keep in mind is that because you do that conversion from lactate to bicarbonate in the liver, any patient with hepatic dysfunction will have accumulation of lactate. And so if you're taking your exam, and this is a question that medical students get pimped on all the time, it can cause confusion in the interpretation of elevated lactate levels. And that elevated lactate level may not be because the patient inherently has an elevated lactate level. It's just that simply the liver, which has some type of, again, disease or dysfunction, was unable to metabolize the lactate into bicarbonate, and so there's an elevated lactate level. The other thing to keep in mind with lactated ringer solution, and I've highlighted all of this part in green for you, is that because lactated ringers has 2.7 milli equivalents per liter of calcium, there's an increased risk of line clotting. And all this means, and really all you need to know, is that some blood products have citrate inside of it, which is used as part of its anticoagulant. And when citrate mixes with the calcium in lactated ringer solution, you have the formation of calcium citrate. And calcium citrate causes clotting and obstruction of the IV line. So what the bottom line here is that you just can't give 
lactated ringer solution and blood products simultaneously through the same line. They can be given at the same time, but they can't be given in the same line. Again, because you don't want the calcium from the LR to mix with the citrate of the blood product. If they get mixed in the same line, calcium citrate forms, it clots the line. So that's something to know for lactated ringers. Again, more of a clinical question that you could be asked when you go on rotation. But this is all you need to know for isotonic crystalloids. So again, normal saline, increased risk of metabolic acidosis, lactated ringers, has calcium, so calcium citrate can clot the line, has lactate, which gets converted to bicarb in the liver, really nice because it acts as a buffer, but if there's any type of hepatic dysfunction, elevated levels of lactate. That's all you need to know for isotonic crystalloids. Now let's take a look at hypotonic crystalloids. So the two big categories of hypotonic crystalloids are your dextrose in water solutions and any type of fractional normal saline. And when I say fractional normal saline, that's not a term that gets used. I'm just suggesting that if you see half normal saline, quarter normal saline, any fraction of normal saline, that is what's referred to as hypotonic saline, which is a type of hypotonic crystalloid. So in the case of dextrose, you're going to see a little number after the D. So it'll, it'll either be D5W or D10W. That's just telling you the percentage of the dextrose in water. In the case of D5W, you have five grams per deciliter. In the case of D10W, you have 10 grams per deciliter. Half normal saline, quarter normal saline, whatever it is, that'll usually be written out as a percentage. So 0.45% sodium chloride, that's half normal. And you could also see that uh, further reduced into quarter normal saline. Although if you're taking an exam, you're getting pimped on this on a clinical rotation, they'll probably just give you half normal saline just for simplicity's sake. In half normal saline, for example, there are 77 milli equivalents per liter of sodium as well as chloride. The big thing to know with hypotonic crystalloids, at least for exams, is for D in water, so D5, D10W, you need to know that this can cause both hyperglycemia and hypokalemia. And then for both your dextrose in water and your half normal saline, this can cause hyponatremia. The hyponatremia is rather simple to understand. You're correcting a free water deficit, and in doing so, when you give somebody a hypotonic solution, this results in hyponatremia. The text that's shown in green is a little bit more complex, although it's a good refresher to refresh your brain on how some physiology works. In the case of D5W and D10W, dextrose is a type of glucose, right? It's a carbohydrate. It's a sugar. When you give somebody carbohydrate or you give somebody sugar, this causes hyperglycemia. So it shouldn't surprise you that a solution full of dextrose causes glucose to go up. As far as the physiology goes, hypokalemia is the more high yield finding here. It's the more high yield adverse effect. What's happening here is that anytime you give somebody glucose, this stimulates the release of insulin. Insulin causes the sodium potassium ATPase to work, which causes potassium to shift intracellularly. And so once the potassium is hidden away in cells, that's hypokalemia. If you measure somebody's sodium level, it will show that it's decreasing or it's decreased. So hyperglycemia and more importantly, hypokalemia are downstream effects of giving somebody dextrose in water. That's really all you need to know for hypotonic crystalloids. Let's conclude by looking at hypertonic crystalloids. So not a whole lot to know here. This is your 3% sodium chloride or your 5% sodium chloride. Don't worry about the compositions. Really the only thing to know here is that the adverse effects potentially is osmotic demyelination syndrome. So anytime you correct severe hyponatremia with a hypertonic crystalloid, you must do this very, very cautiously because there's a serious risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome. The most well-known form of that is central pontine myelinolysis. And this occurs when there's too rapid a correction of hyponatremia. What's happening here on a pathophysiological level is you have osmolar toxicity. So there's direct damage to the myelin sheath of the nerves, typically 
in the ponds, although it can occur elsewhere, via demyelination of white matter tracts, and it also damages astrocytes. So on your exam, what you're going to see is the vignette will tell you that a patient had a low sodium level. Sometimes they don't say it explicitly. Sometimes they just put the lab value in the question, or they describe the symptoms of hyponatremia, or they tell you that the patient had a past medical history of X, Y, or Z, and for whatever reason, their past medical history predisposes them to having hyponatremia, or they're on a medication that can cause hyponatremia. And then what they'll do is they'll describe to you the symptoms of central pontine myelinolysis and then ask you what's happening or what caused that. Those symptoms will be things like locked-in syndrome, dysarthria, dysphagia, diplopia, coma, nausea, vomiting, altered mental status. They're going to describe that to you. It'll be in every question. If this is an exam, it'll be central pontine myelinolysis in the setting of low sodium being corrected too quickly. So again, takeaway here as far as fluids are concerned is that when you use hypertonic crystalloids, just be very cautious on your exam because you can cause osmotic demyelination syndrome, i.e. central pontine myelinolysis. So that's really a, a quick summary of IV fluids, specifically crystalloids. The adverse effects are really what you probably want to know for the purposes of exams, but hopefully this wasn't too complex. So best of luck.